All right, good afternoon and welcome to the third lecture, finally third lecture of uh, Module 2. Uh, this was quite something, eh? we got a three-day vacation because pg and &E turned off electricity. They turned off the power. So, uh, I, it, it, by the way, not my fault. It was not that I somehow told pg and &E to turn off the power to make the point how important electricity and electronics is. I'm sure you knew that beforehand. But uh, given the fact that we heard so much about power or talked about power or didn't have power, uh, I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk a little bit about power and also something that's very closely related to power, and that's energy. So uh, uh, let's talk about that today, and then also... Uh, we're going to talk about the touch screen and we're going to make it finally 2D, two-dimensional, so it can find your fingers anywhere on a surface. All right, so, but first, power. So, uh, this is your core. Maybe not yours. Here is the engine. And here is the tank. Okay, so uh, if you want to drive your car, then the engine turns the wheel. The engine provides power to turn the wheels, okay? So the engine delivers power. Well, how does it do that? Well, in order to do that, it needs energy. So there is somewhere a pipe that pipes this energy to the engine, and there is probably an accelerator or something like that in the middle that tells it, that tells the engine how much energy it should use. So here is energy. When you want to go fast or uphill, then the engine needs to deliver more power, and in order to do that, you depress the accelerator, and then more energy, more fuel, is going to flow from the tank to the engine. Okay? So that's the relationship between energy, which in the car is stored as a chemical, petrol or gas, and power, which the engine where we, the engine takes the energy and turns it into power that makes the vehicle move. So, uh, again, uh, if we want to, if we need more power, then we are all going to use also more energy. And uh, we can put that in a relationship, so the, the, uh, the, uh, sim the, the uh, symbol for energy or the letter for energy is usually E, and the letter for power is usually P, and so Power is really just the energy delivered in a certain amount of time. Okay? Or, if we write this as a simple differential equation, it's dE dt. Okay? So, power is simply the amount of energy that we use per time. Okay? So, that's how they are related. And that's true for for a car engine, and that's true for uh, electricity or any other form of energy and power. Okay, so obviously we can also uh, write this differently. The energy is equal to uh, power times the time that we use this power, or we can write this as an integral of p which, of course, could be a function of time, dt, okay? So those are the fundamental relationships. I mean, there's really only, only this one and then the other one follows uh, uh, between power and energy, okay? So uh, let's look... 
Let's look at an example. A very simple example, a light bulb. Let's say it's one of these fancy new LED light bulbs. It uses 10 watts. Okay, that's probably written somewhere on the bulb. So let's say that we use this uh, uh, for uh, one hour. Then uh, the energy consumed is going to be equal to 10 watts times 10, 10 watts times one hour or 10 watt hour. Okay. The unit for energy is apparently watts times time. And, uh, well, this, this is the unit for power. Maybe I should write this down. Uh, let me put, let, let me, let me put this here. Power is P and the unit is watts and energy is E and the unit actually is joule and this is also equal to power because energy is power times time it's also equal to watts times second so you can use either Joule is just uh, maybe a little bit shorter. Okay, so uh, we already calculated the energy consumed in one hour by our light bulb that uses 10 watts of power. It's a high-efficiency LED light bulb. Okay, so, uh, well, what, what is this unit here? What hour? Well, uh, we can rewrite this very simply. That's 10 times what? And what is an hour? Well, it's simply 3,600 seconds. So this is actually 36,000 watt seconds or 36. Well, 1,000 is kilo, K, and what second is joules? So 36 kilojoules, that's what our bulb uses in one hour. And if we turn it on for, uh, for, uh, for 10 hours, because we have to study for an exam or something, well, then, uh, then the energy would be, be equal to 10 watts times 10 hours or 100 watt hours. If you look and on your electricity bill that PG&E sends you, I'm sure they're not going to be late on that. They're not going to turn that one off. Uh, then you will see that they will charge you per watt hour or maybe per kilowatt hour. It costs about 40 cents or so, at least on my bill. It costs about 40 cents per, per kilowatt hour of electricity. Half of it goes towards generation, so that's actually using a generator making the electricity. And the other half is for distribution, getting it to us when they send it. Okay. So uh, there is one other thing that I want to briefly talk about, and that is batteries. A battery stores energy, of course. It stores it in a chemical format, but it's, it's done in such a way that it's very easily converted to electricity, right? So that's what we use to power our smartphones and so on. So, but how much energy does a battery actually store? Well, it's probably also written somewhere on the battery or at least on the, on the spec sheet that you get when you buy the battery. And the unit is a little bit weird. The unit of energy that is used for batteries is usually amp hours. Okay. Okay. Anybody has seen this? Amp hours. Amp hours. So uh, what's going on here? Well, this actually isn't even, this isn't even really a unit for energy. But really what is meant is that the battery, let's suppose we have a battery, uh, 
uh, a, a, a double A cell. They normally, nominally are, let's say, 1.5 volts, something about approximately 1.5 volts, okay? So the, uh, the voltage of the battery is kind of given, right? And so, uh, so, uh, amp so, so the, the total energy in the battery, the actual energy is simply the V cell times, let's say, this uh, capacity of the battery times capacity of the battery. So this particular uh, battery, let's say, uh, it has 1.5 volts times 1 amp hour. So then this battery would, would store 1.5, there's a volt that I forgot, 1.5 volt times amps is what? Uh, hour. Okay. So, uh, so why, why, uh, so, so what, what I will, of course, uh, 1.5 what I will now is really a unit of energy, and uh, that would be 1.5 times watts times 3,600 seconds, or, uh, well, I'll let you figure that out. So about, about uh, roughly 5,000 watt seconds, or 5,000 joules. Roughly, this, I didn't do the calculation. I need to take off my sweater for somehow, somehow we're lecturing. Lecture uses energy, and that energy ends up in in uh, in heat. <laughs> so, why is it convenient to specify uh, battery uh, 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 battery capacity? in amp hours rather than just joules. Well, the reason is that uh, uh, if we go back with this uh, example of one, uh, one amp hour battery, what this really means is can deliver one amp for one hour. Okay. That's one amp hour. A one amp hour battery can deliver one amp for one hour, or, of course, 0 0.1 amp for, well, how long could the battery deliver, the same battery, the one amp hour battery deliver? Ooh. Hey, we lost. I must. Did I press some? We have button here? Ah, it's back, so, oh, okay. I must, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, so uh, if, if we still have a one amp hour battery, but we're drawing only 0 0.1 amps, how long will the battery last? Last? 10 hours. Okay, right, and of course you can make more examples like, like this one, okay? So, by the way, what is a good model for a battery? Well, a reasonable model for a battery is simply a, a voltage, well, I, I don't need a, a voltage source, and the voltage of the battery is V, and the current is right. With one caveat, as we use the battery, over time, if this was just a voltage source, then uh, what we would see is the voltage is simply constant over time. But if it's a battery, well, then at some point we've used up all the energy of the battery, and then, of course, the voltage is going to drop and the battery is going to be dead. Okay? 
in the, in the homework and also in most of our calculations, we're not going to worry about what exactly is happening here. We're simply going to approximate this with a rectangle. The battery lasts, for example, for 10 hours, this one, and then the battery is dead, and the voltage, instead of being 1.5 volts or whatever our battery voltage should be, is going to be zero. Okay, we can't use it anymore. So we're going to use the same symbol, but we need to remember that uh, this is going to be true only as long as there is energy in our battery. Okay, so uh, yes. Yes, yes. If you if you go and, and uh, uh, search for batteries, for example, if you buy a car battery, they will tell you this car battery is 80 amp hours or something like that. Likewise, if you buy AAA batteries or so, uh, they do not always put that on uh, retail uh, kind of labeling. But if you search on the web, you will find that this battery actually has uh, 2,000 milliamp hours. Usually they say 2,000 milliamp hours instead, or 2,200 milliamp hours instead of saying 2 amp hours. It would be the same thing, right? Uh, or, uh, or, uh, or a, uh, what is, uh, M? Well, what, yeah, yeah, anyways, you find these, and then sometimes you can buy better batteries that have a little bit higher capacity. Likewise, if you buy a lithium battery, then uh, you probably expect that it, it, it's, it does better than, uh, than an alkaline battery, for example, of the same size. Okay, yeah, but that's a very good question. So, uh, so if you're concerned with uh, how long something lasts, uh, and you want to get the best battery, then search a little bit on the web and you'll find this amp hours. You will not probably find Joule, but you will find the amp hour uh, labeling. Okay, so uh, now uh, let's, uh, let's add a little bit more uh, sort of physics. Let's, let's go from uh, Energy, energy and power, let's relate those to volts and current, volts and amps, okay? So, uh, first of all, we need a definition. So, volts is actually, volts actually is a unit that is defined in terms of energy. Uh, and uh, so the voltage between two points A and B is defined as uh, DAB DQ. And what is meant by this, so, so we're not going to go very deep on this. Uh, you can take a physics class, so they will explain this to you better, but in more details. But, but I, I still give you a little bit of the gist what this means. Uh, voltage is the energy that it takes to move an electronic charge from point A to point B. Okay? So the voltage between A and B, two points in space, is the energy required to take a charge, an electron, for example, and move it from A to B. Okay? And uh, then uh, the, this, the next thing is charge, electronic charge, and that's typically, for, uh, for example, man, uh, typically electrons, for example, electrons. Could also be protons, but they don't like to move around much, so we're going to use uh, use electrons. So now you cannot see charge, of course, but you can see the effect of charge, and uh, you probably have seen seen this, right? So what's actually going on? There are lots of charges in the hair of this little girl, and uh, charges because if they all have the same sign, they don't like each other. They try to go far apart from each other, and so they make the hair to go as far from each other as they can. Okay, so that's how charge can indirectly look like. So, but how is it related to current? 
i is equal to delta q, so charge is, charge is actually q, delta q over delta t, and again we can write this as a differential equation, dq dt. So current is simply how many charges, how many electrons pass per time. Uh, let's get the units here. Uh, the units of, of voltage, of course, is, well, volts. The units of charge, that is C, and this stands for Coulomb. Okay, Coulomb. And uh, current, we know this already, that is amps. Okay. So, for example, one amp is equal to one coulomb, one C, per one second. So how much is one coulomb? Well, one coulomb is let me I wrote this down somewhere, I thought. Yeah, six point two. Thank you. Times ten to the eighteen. Okay. So, so if you have if you have uh, a current of one amp flowing for one second, then six times ten to the eighteenth electrons have passed through that wire in this one second. So one coulomb is a heck of a lot of electrons. Ten to the eighteenth. Well, how many are we on the Earth? Something like ten something like 8 billion, so it's like 8 times 10 to the 9th. But this 10 to the 9th times more, <laughs> the square of it, right? So it's an incredibly large number. So lots of electrons. Okay, so uh, now the next thing we can do is uh, we know, we, we now can relate We, we can now find what the uh, power is. So we can express power as a function of voltage and current. So power is equal to dE dt. And we said that dE dQ we said that this is the voltage, times dQ dt, this is current. So power is apparently equal to voltage times current. Okay. And of all the equations that I wrote down, this is by far the most important one. I'll use that most often, and so I frame it like this, okay? So if you want to know how much power an electronic circuit uses, all we have to do, or an electronic component, a resistor, for example, uses, all we have to do is you have to figure out the voltage and the current, multiply them together, and that's the, where we are. We have the power, okay? Uh, if we wanted to know the energy, how would we do that? Well, we have to figure out how long are we using this power, right? And then you'd have to multiply with the time. The power times, power times time, well, that's energy. Okay, so uh, now we need to talk again more about this passive sign convention. Okay, so we have an element like this. There can be, it could be a battery, it could be a resistor. Really, doesn't matter. 
And the voltage across this element is V element, and the current that passes through the element is I element. And again, passive sign convention means that uh, the, the voltage is from plus to minus, and the current goes in the same direction from the plus to the minus, okay? If we do it different, then it's not passive sign convention, then all the rules that we're going to write down just now, they're not going to apply. So be careful with, uh, with the direction of voltage and current. So, uh, so P dissipated is equal to V element times I element. The power dissipated is equal to the product of the voltage times the current of our element, provided that we are using the passive sign convention, okay? So we can easily figure out how much power an element dissipates by simply multiplying voltage times current. Uh, what uh, if, if this power dissipated comes out to be negative, let's say minus one, what, what does this mean? What do you think that would mean? Yes. It, it what? The power increases. Uh, was, yeah. Instead of being dissipated, something else maybe happens to the power. Yes. No. No. We. Uh, yeah, yes. Back there. Uh, yes. Back there. Okay, so so let's 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 uh, let's uh, uh, parse this. So that's important <laughs> that we get this right. So power dissipated and power absorbed is really the same thing, right? It, I'm basically I'm taking this one watt and I do whatever with it. Okay, maybe I make light with it if I'm a light bulb. Okay, but. If the power is negative that I'm dissipating, that means I'm really not dissipating power. I'm doing something else. And if you think about a battery, what might the battery do with power? It doesn't dissipate power, it delivers power, right? So when we get negative power, all it means is that the panel, we have something, it could be a battery, that is not Consuming power that is delivering power to the rest of the circuit to make the circuit work, okay? So <coughs> this passive sign convention is kind of slick. It works for any element. It could be a resistor, and resistors we'll see shortly, they usually dissipate power. But it also could be a source, a battery, for example, or a current source, and in that case, it may well be that uh, the power that we calculate is negative which means that it's not dissipated, it's delivered to the rest of the, of the circuit, so the rest of the circuit can do its thing. For example, there might be a touch sensor. It needs power in order to detect touch. Okay? So, negative less than zero means power Okay, so if the power is negative, that means that this element delivers power to the rest of the circuit. Very useful. So let's look, let's look an, at an example. A very simple circuit here consists of a resistor R 
let's say the value of this resistor happens to be 1k ohm. 1k ohm stands, k stands for 1000, so that's 1000 ohm. And then there is a current source, ICS, and it outputs, in our example, 1 milliamp. Okay, one milliamp or a thousandth of an amp milli stands for 10 to the minus 3. Okay? So now what we want to figure out is power dissipated or possibly delivered by both the current source and the resistor. So uh, let's start with the resistor. If we want to figure out how much power this resistor dissipates or uh, delivers, we don't know yet, then uh, we need to figure out the voltage of the resistor, let's call this VR, and we need to also use, figure out what is the current through the resistor, let's call this IR. And again, we are very, very careful, we can pick, you can try it, you can pick the direction of the voltage, whichever way you like, but once you've done that, the current, the direction of the current is given, passive sign convention. And you can try it afterwards uh, yourselves by making, by flipping the current around and seeing whether you calculate the same power. You better should. Okay? So, uh, but we pick this arbitrarily, uh, up, down. And uh, so, uh, well, we could now use node voltage analysis and so on, and that's, of course, perfectly fine. But let me show you uh, in this and in future examples also, also sometimes quicker way. Sometimes it's easier to just use Kirchhoff's current laws or, or Kirchhoff's voltage law directly without doing all the full node voltage analysis uh, in order to get results. So let's do that here. Well, if the current here, ICS, is 1 milliamp, what is IR? Well, Kirchhoff's current law would tell us that all the, all the currents leaving the node, I or, are equal to all the currents entering the node, I, C, S, well, they're equal. These two currents are equal. That makes perfect sense. I mean, the current that comes out of the current source needs to go somewhere, and there is no other connection than this resistor there, so it better flows into the resistor. The electrons do not just sort of disappear, and we're going to run out of electrons or something like that. I don't know, be good. Okay, so uh, these two currents are equal. Well, what is VR? Well, VR, we can now use Ohm's law. VR is equal to R times IR, and that is equal to 1K Ohm times 1 milli Ohm. The K, the kilo, and the milli, they just annihilate each other. 10 to the 3 times 10 to the minus 3, well, this is going to be equal to 1 volt. And now we want to know the power. The power is P, let's call it PR, is equal to VR times IR. And that is equal to 1 volt times 1 milliamp or 1 milliwatt. Okay? So a thousandth of a watt. Is, and is this power dissipated in the resistor, or is the resistor delivering power to the rest of the cell? Yeah. Could, could I? Uh, no, power is watts. Okay, power is watts. And energy is power times time, and then you get what seconds or joule, okay? Good, good question. Yeah, make, let's make sure that we have this clear. Okay. So, uh, so we have power that is plus one milliwatt. That's the power uh, in that resistor. Is this power dissipated in the resistor? Yep, it's dissipated. Dissipated. Uh, anybody, any idea what happens with the power that this resistor dissipates? Yes. 
Exactly, it becomes heat. And do you know of, of something, maybe even own something that does precisely this? Well, if you have an electric cooking range, that's really all it is. It's a resistor. And that resistor turns the electricity into heat. <laughs> Simple as that. Okay, that's not induction cooking. Okay. So, uh, okay, so uh, now uh, let's, let's continue with our example. And uh, we want to know also the, uh, the uh, power of, of the current source. So this is ICS. Well, if that goes like that, then VCS has to go in the same direction. Notice? See? It's not VR. The, di the, the current is flowing always, passive sign convention, is flowing from the plus, plus sign to the minus sign. So ICS, I can write it here again, it's going from plus to minus, And so uh, VCS uh, is the way I've shown it. So be careful about that. Don't just <laughs> pick, copy the signs. I see some question marks in eyes. Somebody has a, wants a cl clarification? Yep. Ah, let's figure that out. So how would you figure that out? Is VCS equal to VR or what is it? So what we are going to do here is we're going to use Kirchhoff's current law. So, figure that out with case KVL, Kir oh, Kirchhoff's voltage law, not current law. Okay? So, we enter here at the positive sign, so that we means we have to sum Vs with the positive sign. Then, we enter again at the positive sign, so we have to add Vr here, and the sum of these must be zero. So now we have the answer to your question. Apparently, VCS is equal to minus VR, is equal to minus one volt. And so PCS is equal to VCS times ICS is equal to minus one volt time. Uh, ICS was one milliamp, so that is equal to minus one milliwatt. Is the current source delivering power or is it dissipating power? Uh, it's delivering power. It's negative, delivers power. In this particular case, it delivers the power to the resistor. Okay. Okay, so uh, the uh, uh, the current source delivers power. Let's let's uh, calculate something. Let's calculate P R plus P C S. Well, the P R was equal to one milliwatt plus P P C S was minus one milliwatt. The sum is zero. Does this surprise you? Why not? What, what's really the reason for this? Well, the reason really is conservation of energy. If, uh, if uh, uh, one element would deliver more power than the other one absorbs, uh, somehow this energy would have to go somewhere. It cannot go anywhere. So this is going to be true for all circuits. If you calculate the power dissipated by all the elements in a circuit, you add it all together, the sum is always going to be zero. Okay? So that's very helpful if we do some calculations or so. We can check afterwards whether we did things right. Yes. So uh, uh, what, what's happening with, uh, if you have a short circuit? So, uh, so uh, for sh short circuit, 
So, for example, if we had, let's say, current source like this, and we had a short circuit right across it, well, what's the voltage here? Now, in this particular case, VCS and V short circuit are equal, right? Because the, you can use, again, KVL. So V short circuit, well, what is that? That's zero volts, right? So that means that this here is zero volts also. What's the power? Well, it's going to be VCS times ICS. I have even told you what ICS is. But does it matter? Well, this is zero. Well, this is going to be zero, okay? So this is one example of short circuit. So there is example two of short circuit. Let's say this was a voltage source. And we did this. Well, if, if you did this with a battery, you had a battery and you were to just connect the two prongs of the battery with the wire, what would happen? What do you think what would happen? It would get hot really fast, and the battery, depending on what battery it is, it would explode. Never do this with the car battery, or you will be based in, uh, in acid, okay? So, uh, so, so, all, all the laws that we derived and so on, they still apply. And the reason is that this wire here, even though we model it normally as a resistor, a short circuit is a resistor with zero ohms, doesn't really exist, right? So, uh, so in reality, there is a little resistance, and that little resistor, this is a wire, it's going to dissipate a lot of energy in a hurry, and it gets really, really hot. Same thing as your electric uh, cooking appliance, except that uh, that's not the purpose. So don't do this. Yes. Yeah, the current is very high. Yeah, like, like let's say let's say you had here a, a 12 volt uh, a 12 volt car battery, and the, this resistance, let's say, was 10 to the minus 3 ohm, 1 milli ohm. Right? It's a decent sized wire. Well, then, uh, uh, I is equal to uh, voltage over resistance. That is equal to 12 volts divided by 10 to the minus 3 ohms. So that is equal to 12. This is a big current. It's a hell of a current. You need a wire this big so the wire doesn't melt. Okay? Unless you are, uh, you are uh, building these huge high voltage transmission wires or so, don't use 12,000 amps. It's not going to last for a long time. And maybe you are not going to last for a long time to do that. <laughs> so. Okay, so, so the resistor makes heat. And again, a light bulb would use this energy, at least some of the energy, hopefully most of it. LEDs are better than uh, old incandescent to make light. And then of motors, they make magnetic energy and ultimately make wheels turn and so on. So there are lots of, lots of ways to take electrical energy and uh, make something else out of it, not just heat. Okay? So... Uh, So, just one more example, let's, a little bit quickly, so then I'm not going to run out of time. So, this is example two. So, here we have voltage V1, and here we have current I1. So we have a voltage source and we have a current source and they sort of are uh, arranged in a, like a snake that bites itself in a circle. Okay, so... Uh, so we want to figure out, let's say, we want to figure out the power uh, uh, dissipated by the 
by the uh, by each element. Yeah. So so this one, this voltage, so, so this voltage here is going to be V1, and sorry, I, I made a mistake here. The voltage, if we want to, if we want to figure out uh, the uh, power dissipated in the current source, we need to use passive sign conventions. The plus is here, and this is a big fat minus sign because I made a mistake. And so this is going to be equal to V C one. Let's let's call this C. I see one. So now we know what V one is, right? So we can use again. Uh, Kirchhoff's, uh, Kirchhoff's law. So we enter V1 at the minus sign, so we get minus V1, KVL. We get minus V1. Then we enter again at the minus sign, so that is minus VC1 equals zero. We're done with the loop, so they need to add up to zero. Okay? And the reason we get two minus signs is we enter at the minus sign, we enter again at the minus sign, so we need to use minus signs instead of pluses. Make sense? Okay. So, so from here, of course, we can uh, figure out that VC1 is equal to minus V1. In, in fact, it's exactly the same as we had before. Let's say that this was one volt and this one was one amp. So then we have P, current source, is equal to V minus V1, VC1, this minus V1, times IC1, so that is going to be equal to minus 1 volt times 1 amp, and that is equal to minus 1 watt. Is the current source delivering power, or is it a dissipating power? It's delivering power. Who, who does it deliver power to? Who does it deliver power? Where does this power go? It has to go to the battery. So, so the, the battery needs to, needs to, because the powers, they sum up all to zero. What does it need to do, this battery? It needs to dissipate power. It has to. So uh, let's figure out uh, the current. The current here, this one amp is flowing like this. So that's I1 is equal to one amp. Keeps going the same direction. So P voltage source is equal to V1 times, well, IC1. So that is equal to plus one watt. And the sum is equal to zero, like it should be. And that means that the voltage source, even though it's a source, it's not at all, not at all delivering power to the rest of the circuit. It's actually burning up power. Hopefully it's a rechargeable battery. If it's not, then all sorts of things could happen. Maybe it just turns it into heat. And maybe it turns it into a spectacular what is it? Fourth of July display. <laughs> okay? So this is a circuit that is sort of interesting to illustrate how, uh, how things work, to think about things, but maybe not a circuit we want to build. Okay. So, uh, so that, that much about power. So now let's switch topics a little bit. Okay? In fact, let's make it a little bit. This week you're starting, and then next week you're going to put together uh, a touch screen. So uh, this week you're going to build the, uh, the green stuff. There's going to be some resistors. You're going to solder. Who has soldered already? Okay, most of you, you're, I'm, you're ahead of me. And then, uh, but this one you haven't seen yet, huh? Eh? This one is new. So you're going to hook up a little computer to this thing, and then when, once you do that, it becomes a 2D touch screen. So how does this thing work? So, 10, 2D. Oh, 
Okay. We already had built a 1D touchscreen, okay? So let's remind ourselves how that thing worked. So that was a sheet, a resistive sheet, and then on either side there were contacts like this. These were like, like wires or so. They had very low resistivity, essentially zero. Uh, very small. And then this one had a sheet resistance row that was greater than zero. So, and what we found, we did the analysis last time, what we found is that the, if we call this direction x, and uh, we, we make this the voltage, if we connect this to ground here, and uh, then put the voltage source Vs here, then the way this works is that if we were to somehow figure out what is the voltage at this point here, then uh, that voltage would be some value here, okay? And the voltage down here, well, the voltage down here is going to be zero, so, and the voltage up here is going to be Vs. So, yes. So the, vol the voltage along, uh, along this thing is going to be just like this. Okay? We've calculated this uh, a week ago, a week ago before the power outage, okay? So, uh, uh, so, so the, uh, one of the problems we had was that the, how are we going to with touch, how are we going to figure out uh, how we're going to connect to this point here. We don't want to stick a wire there. That's not, kind of much, not much of a touch screen, right? If you have to tell people, yeah, you need to use this wire, I need to stick it there, and it will figure out where your wire is. No, it won't. Okay, so the way, the way we fix that is uh, if we look at this from, uh, from the side, then we made basically two sheets. One of them, one of them was just a conductor, like this. And the other one was a, uh, what was that green thing? I'm, so I'm, I'm drawing basic cross section now. Was this green thing, and where, wherever we touch, it's gonna, gonna bend down, like this. Okay. And, uh, and then we, again, we put our voltage source. We, uh, we, we do this already, right? Same as before, we said that this was ground. So I kind of turned everything, flipped everything 90 degrees, and then I cut it, or cut it across to look at what's going on. And uh, uh, the, the red sheet below it well, that is simply the taking the, the function of wherever we are touching, we are sampling that voltage. And that voltage we send to a voltmeter. Right? So the voltmeter displays, if you scale it right, just the coordinate x where we are touching. Okay. So this is our 1D Touch sensor. Why is it 1D? Well, I can touch anywhere I want here. It will figure out where I am, what is the x coordinate. But if I touch instead of uh, over to the left side, if I instead of touching in point A, I touched in point B, and this is the same value of x, what would I get? Exactly the same voltage, right? Because the voltage drops from top to bottom. But left to right, there is nothing asymmetric, so the voltage is always the same. Okay? Now we make, need to make this 2D. What does it mean, 2D? Well, it means that then we actually can distinguish points A and B. We cannot point, only distinguish A and B. Let's say this was C here, but we can also distinguish, ah, you, 
you, you touched over in B and not in A. Okay? It's the 1D, we can't do that. So how could we make this 2D? Let's, let's do something simple first. Maybe, let's say if we, if we had two 1D touch screens, can you think of some way to use those to make it 2D? Any ideas? This is how design works. With design, we, we, you know, we do something, maybe it's not the most elegant, we do something simple that gets us in the right direction, yes. Perfect, perfect. Let, exactly, that's what, we, that's what we could do, right? We take the first touch screen and we have it just like this, okay? Then we take the second one, but that one we turn 90 degrees, so what was X now is Y. Okay? And then we have to put them on top of each other. And we have to put some insulator in between. And heck, you know, it's electronics, so we need to have two voltmeters and, and, and two voltage sources and so on. But it's electronics, cheap stuff, right? It's easy to do that. Okay? So now we have a 2D touchscreen. Easy, huh? Easy. So that's how you design stuff. You do it simple and I have a solution. Then, then when you have come up with this incredible idea, you say, is it actually good? Well, it's okay, it works, but imagine we make all these layers of things. It gets a bit thick, it gets a bit squishy, right? Because we need to Maybe you need a lot of force pushing on this stuff. I mean, it's, it's kind of not, not perfect. Also, if you think about it, you use it on your phone, you would like it to be transparent, right? Fortunately, it turns out that there are electrical conductors that are indeed uh, transparent, something called ITO. ITO. You can Google that. Uh, but, you know, the more layers you put on top of each other, the less light gets through. So at some point, your phone gets a bit dim or so. So it's not so great. So let's, let's go and think about Ref2, whether we couldn't somehow make this a little bit, a uh, little bit more clever. 11. So it's still 2D touchscreen. So what we have is, we have a, a first layer for the first touch screen and again that one is maybe like this and uh, it's co contacted here so yes yes let's say it goes across here And then we have a second touch screen, and uh, that one also needs a layer that corresponds to the red, red layer. Of, and then there is going to be another resistive layer on top of this one. And uh, this one is going to look like this. It's also going to be touched in the same point. Now, there is going to be a similar source Vs, but that source Vs is going to be connected between here and, it's getting a little bit ugly here, but uh, that Vs, it needs to be, it needs to be connected at 90 degrees because it's the other touch screen, so somehow like this. So it looks somehow like this, and there is now one mistake, and that is I should have, I should have somehow made it, uh, drawn this, and it gets now really ugly, so that you push so hard that everything gets squished together at that point where you touch it, okay? So your finger is somewhere up here, your finger is somewhere up here. Here, where can I draw a finger? Well, 
this is your finger, and you push down here, and it squishes everything together, so the, the blue one touches the black, and on the black you measure the voltage, you get the uh, Y coordinate, and then uh, uh, the, uh, there is an insulating layer that I haven't, I haven't drawn here that pushes the, uh, makes no contact, but pushes the green one down, it touches the red one, and there you measure the voltage and get, get to the X coordinates. Right? It sort of gets a little bit complicated. So, so but the, the concept is pretty straightforward. Simply use two of these touch screens, touch sensors. Now, now I wonder whether we need all these layers. For example, the, the red layer and the black layer, they are only there to measure the voltage, right? Could we somehow, could we maybe somehow merge these, use, use the same layer for both? Well, perhaps we could do that. Perhaps, what if we did the following? First, we first connected the source Vs to the blue sheet, and then measured the y coordinate, okay, on, on the co now combined black and red sheet, okay, we measure that y coordinate. Then afterwards, we unplug some wires and so on, we connect now the source here, okay, we, we still keep touching, and then we measure, uh, again, we, we have merged now the the red and the black one together is one sheet. We measure again the voltage, but now the voltage, because we connected Vs differently to the other screen, uh, we, we get the x coordinate, okay? So basically, we make two measurements, one first, the other one second. It's still a bit clunky, but we have to <laughs> say, touch this thing, okay, no, okay, now, now fine, uh, wait for a second, I need to reconnect and then uh, touch again now, all right, so now I have X and Y, I, I know where you're touching, okay. But let's keep that for just a little bit later, we'll fix that, we'll fix this, it's not not yet perfect, right, but we're still in the design phase, we're not done with the product launch yet. So, so now, another crazy idea, we, have, we are now down to just three layers, we have the blue layer, the green layer, those are the two resistive touch layers, and then we have the combined black and red layer, okay, that we use both to measure X and Y coordinates. So the crazy idea is, why do we need three layers? For one touch screen, we needed only two, so why can't we do the same thing? We use the two layers first to measure X, and then we use the two layers to measure y. Let me try to draw this. So, in this case, what we have are uh, just two layers like this. Uh, this layer is connected like this. And then on top of it, we also have a blue layer And here we touch the blue layer. And again, I'm going to make the same sort of perspective thing in order to show how we would contact this. So this one we would contact here. And, well, this should go down here. This one we contact here. So when we contact a voltage source, we would put the voltage source here. When we want to contact this one, we put the voltage source here. Okay? So now, how does this work? How does this work? So, first, let's say we want to measure this coordinate. Let's call this the coordinate Y. Or, or, or X, X. Okay, we measure first X. Okay, so what we are going to do is we, we actually, let's call this VSX. We turn this source on. We connect this source, okay? And uh, we touch. And so this is going to... Oh, 
I, I made this wrong. So we're going to measure this coordinate first. Let's call this y. Okay. Okay, and uh, we, we we turn this one off. Turn this one. Let, let me let me draw this separately. It's going to be a little bit easier. So we are going to have the two layers. And the contacts are here on this layer and here. And then we also have below it, we have the other layer that, of course, also has a, a 3D like this. Okay. And uh, the contacts on this one are here. Okay. So like we had said before, we will first con contact our source, let's say here, to this side, okay? So now the voltage here is going to decrease from over here, the voltage is going to be Vs. It's going to decrease to over here, the voltage is going to be zero, right? The same thing as we had done here, except that it's flipped, okay? We can do that. And uh, up here, we measure the voltage that corresponds to this coordinate, let's call this coordinate x. So this is going to be Vx, okay? We measure that voltage, okay? So then, uh, and of course, this one here, we have to ground and so on, okay? Then afterwards, we are going to remove this guy, and we are going to instead connect a voltage source here, Okay, it could be the same one. Okay. And then, uh, then we, 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 we uh, I guess we need to, we, we touch, we, we, I, I didn't, still didn't draw this very, we touch somewhere here, we are going to get, the, the voltage now is going to change between this, this, this one, let's say ground, the voltage is going to, look like this. It's going to be going from ground up to Vs here. Right? So depending on where we touched here, this is the Y coordinate, depending on where we touched here, we get a different voltage, this voltage here, and that voltage now will appear on the green layer. Huh? I'm not doing a terrific job. So uh, so first, we measured we measured on the blue layer, and we had the source down here. Now we simply flip things around. We put the source up here, and we measure on the green layer, and here we get now, anywhere on that green layer, we, we need to disconnect the source. We are going to measure now the voltage Vy. Okay? Yes? Right. Perfect. Exactly. That's what we. That's what we need. We are. We are gonna. Oh, why is this? Uh, we are gonna. We are gonna ne need need to first measure on the green uh, on the blue sheet, and then afterwards we're gonna have to measure on the green sheet. So we have just. Ha we are just gonna have two sheets. Okay, just two sheets. And. We make two different measurements. First, we connect the voltage source Vs to the green sheet, and we measure on the blue sheet. And then afterwards, we disconnect the voltage source, we connect it instead to the blue sheet, and now we measure on the green sheet. Okay? And so first, we get the x-coordinate, and next, we get the y-coordinate. Okay? So the only little, little thing we need to fix is that we don't want to go in and rewire our circuit, right? Every time you want to get X, now you need to... But that's, that's what 
this guy is for, this little microcontroller. And we can tell it, you know, uh, just like you could tell one of you, go press the, press the switch there, an electric switch there. We can tell this microcontroller to open and close an electric switch using its signals. It doesn't use a finger. Right? It uses electricity to uh, open and close a switch. So the microcontroller makes these connections and breaks them. And the microcontroller also does the measurement. And it, it can measure... We can measure on the green or on the blue layer, and we can even have two little measurement circuits in our microcontroller that makes these measurements. And because the microcontroller is very fast, the switching happens so fast that you couldn't even remove your finger between the two measurements. Okay? So, so the way this thing kind of looks like, if we look at it now from the top, is that uh, we are going to have the blue layer and we are going to have contact at the bottom and at the top of the blue layer. Okay, So that's where we can connect either our source or alternatively we can connect our, uh, we can connect our voltmeter and we have a second layer on top, like this. And that one is con contacted east and west, or left and right, like this. And then we have our microcontroller. Okay, microcontroller. And that microcontroller controls a bunch of switches. So the, uh, the microcontroller has a switch like this that goes to, connects this one to ground, or has a switch like this that contacts this one to ground. And likewise, the microcontroller has a switch up here, two switches, And that's connect to this voltage source. Okay. So now we are going to program the microcontroller so that it first connects the blue layer. So we, we make it in, in, in situation A. This switch is closed and this switch is closed. Okay. So now the voltage source is connected to the blue layer. And then we also tell the microcontroller, hey, you know, Go and measure using your voltmeter. Go and measure the voltage on the green layer. And that gives us Vx. Okay? Okay, the microcontroller. We cannot even blink with our eyes and it's already done. Okay? These things are fast. You know that. This microcontroller is just cheaper than your laptop, but it's the same thing. Cheaper and simpler and smaller and lower power and whatnot. Okay? So then, then we program the microcontroller such that as soon as it's done with that measurement, we tell it now open the switches labeled A. They need to be open now, but close the switches labeled B. And now go and make a measurement anywhere. On the blue one, put the voltmeter here, and that gives us Vy. Hmm? So what have we done? We said, we designed a 1D, a 1D resistive touchscreen. Worked like a charm, but it was 1D. Then we said, you know, we just make two, take two of them, put them 90 degrees apart. Now it's 2D, great, but then it was four layers and so on, we didn't like that. Then we said, you know, let's get rid of some layers and get the help of the microcontroller to do some switching stuff. And we have a 2D touchscreen with just two layers. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't be uh, oh, okay look call call x and y as if you uh, as you like uh, just flip them we could call the coordinates a and b whatever right we want to bo know both coordinates how we call them not so important okay All right, there is one little thing that I just want to, I, I'm not going to, uh, but I, uh, I, I'll let you think about, a little bit about that. I think this is actually 12. And uh, you remember that the way we model our 1D touch screen was really with, say, voltage divider. And then we said, depending on where we are touching, we had two resistors, R1 and R2, that produced, now, so this is Vs, that produced a voltage Vs. That gives us, for example, the X or Y coordinate. And uh, then we put our voltmeter here. Okay? We measured with this voltmeter. Okay? Now, now, uh, normally we just had a connection here, but now, the connection is going to be through either the green or the blue sheet. But these sheets are sort of resistive, right? So now what we apparently did was we suddenly connected the resistor, R3, in between here. And the value of R3 even makes things worse. The value of R3 changes, right, depending on where exactly we touch on that screen. We're not going to calculate this, but the value of this resistor R3 is going to be different. Isn't that going to somehow mess up our measurement of voltage here? Are we still measuring the correct voltage regardless of the value of R3? Sometimes it's going to be 1K ohm, and then we touch in another place, then, then this uh, resistor R3 is going to be only 500 ohms or whatever. Isn't this going to make our measurement here that gives us the X or the Y code, and isn't going to make that measurement incorrect? And if not, why not? I'll let you think about it, and uh, you're welcome to come to the office hours, and otherwise, we will discuss it next time on Thursday. All right? But we have a 2D touchscreen. And uh, here is the microcontroller. <laughs>